All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fourth day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. And let's go right over to Scripture to 1 Timothy 1. To verse 2. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, no other teaching, nor give heed to fables, muthos, myths, inventions, narratives, false stories, or even true narratives. That's what the word means. Do not give heed to those things. Obviously, uh, useless nonsense that's not the Word of God, and endless genealogies that cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is in or by faith. And uh, this is the New King James, and I will edit things, uh, translations, as I go to try to make things clearer. Translation is a difficult business. Unfortunately, sometimes it actually is a business about making money. The love, of, the love of money is root of all kinds of evil. Uh, the King James says all evils. That's not exactly the best way to say it, at least today. I don't know. I'm really not, uh, since I was, I'm not a native King James speaker. None of us are. And I, I, I really like the King James. But I find that because I don't verbally use it that often, don't verbally preach out of the King James currently, that uh, it does get a little awkward. (laughs) And uh, it's not always easy to understand. And I have to check things quite often, but I usually do anyway. I go back and and look at the original language uh, most of the time, which I am not fluent in either. (laughs) No one is fluent in Koine Greek, uh, in Galilean Koine Greek. It's just because uh, nobody was born today living, w- grew up in that environment. And there is. There's, there's actually quite a difference in language. Even like in Mexico, the, the, the language of the Mexican border is not the same as the language of Mexico City. And people from Mexico City that move in, up into that area sometimes themselves have problems with the Spanish of the locality. Just something we need to be keep uh, keep aware of. Um, that's why one of the reasons translation is difficult. But we have to remember, and because King James onlyism, um, and even to a greater extent, the 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 use of the King James, which is the traditional English Bible and has been for more than four hundred years, and the reason it's been around and popular for four hundred years is it's a very good translation. But when we're talking about preaching the gospel and taking the gospel out of, out of the traditional conservative church world, out into the streets, out into the highways and byways, it is not an appropriate translation to use. Because, unless you're going to explain it as you go, because of the fact that it is, that it is written in late 16th century English that was becoming archaic even when the King James Bible was printed, first printed in 1611. And while I'm on that subject, let me say that none of you out there actually probably use a a, a King James, a 1611 King James. 
People say that all the time. I use the 1611 King James. Where do I have one? By the way, this is a really nice King James, published, I don't know where you can get anything, by local church Bible publishers. And uh, this is a actually a local church. There, I think there's more than one church in, the, in Michigan that does this. Let me bring it up on the screen. Can you see that? Local church Bible publishers. Do we have a, an address for him? I don't see it right here. It says, uh, text conformable to that of the edition of the 1611, commonly known as the Authorized or King James Bible. Yeah, the trans, a new trans, a, actually it's not exactly a new translation, but it was author, an authorized revision of the Bishop's Bible, authorized by King James, who was actually a, a fairly wise king. He had... We need to cut him some slack sometimes, too, because he had to satisfy even the king of a, an entire nation. Uh, you have to try to satisfy everybody. So the Puritans were a pain in his backside, really, and they wanted all kinds of reforms to make the Church of England the way they wanted it to be without regard to what anybody else wanted. And so what he did is say, yo, I'm not going to do that, but I'll give you a better translation. The Bishop's Bible is pretty bad. Um, the King James, the New Testament especially, is about 95% Tyndale's work. And Tyndale actually threw the Geneva Bible. And if you examine it, as I have done, you'll find out it's a lot of cut and paste. It's not an original translation, not most of it. About every third or fourth verse might be original, neither neither Gene uh, Tyndale Geneva, uh, which or the bishops. Sometimes they use the bishops' verse. Sometimes they'll use a Tyndale slash Geneva verse. Sometimes they'll, they'll redo it a little bit. And I probably don't have one out here right now. Not what I want to look for. The New King James, contrary to falsehoods propagated among independent Baptists, that the uh, New King James is not uh, a simply a update of the King James. It is. It uses the same Greek and Hebrew texts. The only changes that were made in it were changes they thought that they really needed to make because to make it slightly more accurate, sometimes as simple as changing heaven to heavens because the original language might have the plural rather than the singular. Not that there's nothing significant in that. Uh, sometimes when I look at it, especially when I'm looking at it on the screen with other translations and the original language, I wish they would have trans actually made more changes to make it even better. Of course, it was done, I think, in 1982. Uh, the biggest problem with it is owned by a private for-profit corporation. And it's copyrighted. One of the great things about the King James is you can copy it. Uh, again, this, this right, right here, let me show you the inside. Very clear, very uh, good-sized print for preaching. A got a leather cover on it a good quality cover and no notes and no cross references what you need when you preach verse by verse i have a king james from thomas nelson that's verse by verse very hard to find verse by verse anymore and the reason that's important if you're teaching or preaching you don't want paragraph text it's harder to work with you stop, it's, it's, you can't find your place as easy. All right, so a little on the Bible there. Well, let's go over to 1 Timothy. Again, I'm using the New King James because it's accurate. It's simply a revision of the King James. You're already using, nobody uses a 1611 
Uh, does your Bible have the Apocrypha, the uh, Deuterocanonical book, books in the Old Testament? If it does, if it doesn't, it's not a 1611, because those books were included in 1611. They weren't dropped until sometime in the 19th century when publishers just stopped putting them in. So, uh, you know, that the Catholics could really go after you on that. And most most Christians wouldn't know how to answer. <laughs> they would be flabbergasted. What are you talking about? So the, 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 the making the King James Bible into an idol can be a problem, is a problem. We've had people that, that have gone totally overboard. Uh, if you'd say the King James is the best of a translation available, fine. But just remember, the purpose of a translation is to communicate to the people in their own common language. And late 16th century English is not the common language anywhere in the world today. So it has a problem with that. Again, what is the purpose of translating? So people can understand the scriptures. Otherwise, we just distribute Greek Bibles, Greek New Testaments, and how many people could read it at all? You can struggle through a King James but especially, I mean, if you've grown up with it, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But we're supposed to be preaching the gospel to everyone. They don't understand it. It's a stumbling block to many people. And that's something we're going to be talking about. Not the King James being a stumbling block so much, but stumbling blocks in general. 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 2. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I urged you, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. No other doctrine that, that, than that was delivered once for all unto the saints. The doctrine of the apostles. The doctrine of Jesus Christ. No other teaching. And today we could say no psychology, no sociology, no man-made theology. That's why I appreciate the woman that tagged me with the charge of holding to scriptura nuda. She said, you're not script sola scriptura, you're scriptura nuda. Because she thought that the Reformed were sola scriptura. I said, no, they're not. They've got all this theology that they read, that they interpret the Bible through. It's not just them. Dispensationalism, uh, Reformed theology, all kinds, all these man-made systems. I don't want them. I don't want any of them. I prefer my Bible naked, not wrapped in man's opinion in other doctrine, other teaching. And I hope you're the same. God's word, not man's opinion. And that's, that's where the whole issue of textual criticism comes in, too. The King James, the New King James, uses the same text as the King James. Don't let deceivers out there or ignorant people out there tell you otherwise. I've heard some critiques of the, of the New King James. These people are completely ignorant. They've never even looked into it. They've got an axe to grind. Who was that woman that was going around uh, that were independent fundamentalist Baptists were putting uh, uh, in their pulpits? The, 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 uh, the woman that did the, uh, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, I probably got around here somewhere. The satanic... Uh, uh, editions or something like that. I can't remember what it was. She was, she had a degree in home decorating. And people like James White, who is a Reformed Baptist, now a theonomist, po post-millennial, preterist. <sighs> what a bad, what a toxic brew that is. 
But he uh, he uses P uh, Gale something or other, I think her name was, um, uses things like that to attack the King James. The King James is not worthy of attack. It's the greatest English translation ever. It's just become dated. And again, the one you're using, unless you're some really strange person uh, that, that has no problem reading blackface print and you like to have the... Uh, the deuterocanonical things in your Old Testament that aren't inspired by God. Uh, the publishers probably took them out because it costs money to print. You know, every page you don't have to print is cheaper. It makes the Bible cheaper. Anyway, you're not using the 1611. <laughs> Just telling you. Besides, the 1611 was exclusively pulpit Bibles. If your Bible doesn't weigh 30 pounds... It's not a 1611. It says there's so much foolishness, I've got to pick on, on them a little bit. But the, the, there, is, there is no English translation that is comparable to the King James. And again, the New King James is simply an update of the language. It's, they did not change much at all, uh, just made it readable in modern English. I wish they would have had changed a few other things in there more than they did, but that's not so much the issue. If you're using the King James in your church, fine. But don't try to go to the world with it. It's a stumbling block. People out there just doesn't, don't understand it. They, they, the unregenerate can't understand it anyway. But if you're speaking in these and thous, most people in church don't read that when they read the King James anyway. They, they update it as they go. Remember that. The purpose is to communicate the Word of God to people in their own language. Otherwise, why bother? To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies, man-made ideas, man-made nonsense, and disputes about things that are irrelevant, even if they're on the script in the Scriptures. The genealogies have a particular person purpose, but that purpose is not for most people. It was for the Jews to show the ancestry of Jesus going back to David. To establish his credentials as eligible to be the Messiah. And arguing about the difference between the genealogies in Matthew versus the genealogies in Luke just causes disputes. Rather than godly edification which is in or by faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle, useless, empty talk. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, not as a way of righteousness. Using it to convict people of sin, but not to make them right with God. Uh, allowing people to believe that they can be right with God, telling people to put away their sins in order to be saved, is not using the law right, nor is it using the word repent right. Even if that is a common understanding, it is a wrong understanding. The word is metanoia, which means change your mind, a change of mind, a change of mind regarding what righteousness is, where it comes from, regarding sin and God. And an unsaved person cannot put away their sins because they're nothing but sin. Everything they do is sin. Apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing, nothing good. 
They have not. They don't have the capacity to do what is right in the sight of God. All their righteousness is a filthy rags. The only righteousness they have is self-righteousness. They need to repent of that. They need to repent of unbelief. To recognize they're not right with God, and they need a Savior. That's what repentance is. I heard a Baptist preacher Sunday. Not in the church I usually attend. Telling people the reason they haven't been born again is because they haven't surrendered everything to God. How can an unregenerate sinner do that? That's the John MacArthur School of Lordship Salvation, his version of Lordship Salvation. Make Jesus your Lord, and then you can be saved. Which is really weird, because John MacArthur is also a Calvinist. He's a confused pretty much everything. No. Get saved, and then God will clean up your life. Cry out to God to save you, and then he does the work. That is the difference between the new covenant and the old. Under the law, it's what you did. Under the new covenant, which is what Jesus purchased for us and brought in on the cross, it's God's work. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. It's God's good works. He's the one that cleans our lives up. He's the one that makes us right in his sight. He gives us a righteousness that's not our own. And then he's at work in us, transforming us over time into the image of Christ until he returns, then we'll instantly be transformed. Okay? A little digression here, but this other doctrine, this false gospel, false preaching, telling people, uh, the, the Pentecostals, they do this all the time. They don't know what the gospel is. Repent of your sins. The Bible nowhere says, repent of your sins. Search the scriptures yourself. It doesn't say that anywhere in the scripture. That's an idea we've read into it because we've been taught it. Not so much for Lutherans because they don't worry about that. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about it. Of course, the denomination I was raised in doesn't exist anymore because they went and joined the apostates. Oh, yikes. I couldn't go back if I wanted to, which would be really crazy. No. No, no, no. There, there are Lutherans that are genuinely, say, born again and saints. But they're not common. I, you could probably say the same thing about everybody. God has his people in some strange places, okay? For his own reasons. He has them there as witnesses, I think. And there's a thorn in the flesh to the others. But they'll probably be driven out sooner or later. Now, the purpose of the commandment, of our instruction, okay, the commandment's not the best choice here. Again, uh, New King James, there's some words, they, it would have been probably better if they would have changed them, and this is one of them. It's not about commandments. It's, it's the message that Paul and the apostles were preaching. It's their teaching. It is love from a pure heart, or the, the purpose, or goal, the end, the telos, uh, it is the, the purpose of the instruction is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith, or unfeigned faith, unpretended faith, which is what the King James says, unfeigned. But sincere, you see there are different words. One's easier understood than how many people know what unfeigned means anymore. Not many from which some, have, having strayed, have turned aside to idle, empty, vain talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things that they affirm. 
but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, who's a righteous person? One that st strives to, tra uh, to obey the commandments or one that trusts in Christ for his salvation, his righteousness? Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. Who is that? The one that believes God, believes God's promises, trusts in God's Savior, believes what Jesus did on the cross. That is, that is the person who is righteous in the sight of God. The person that's trying to work out their salvation, working for their salvation, thinking that it's their righteous deeds that will gain an entrance into heaven, is not righteous in the sight of God but is a blasphemer, a denier, because he does not trust in God's salvation, but rather chooses to trust in his own works. By works of law, or works at all, no flesh will be justified. It's not made for the righteous person, not made for the Christian, but for the lawless and insubordinate for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, All right, so we're talking about teach no other gospel and those who desire to be teachers of the law. Those that go about teaching the law say you must believe in Christ plus you must do this. Paul said, curse them. Deliver them up to God for him to destroy them. Read the epistle to Galatians and read it and read it until you understand it and how serious adding works to the gospel is. Those that teach that, twice Paul says, let them be accursed. It's a command. The church isn't to tolerate that. Look at today. The vast majority of Christendom believes in a salvation that is of grace plus works. Vast majority. And it's taught by even people like John Piper, a very popular and very bad teacher, that finally exposed what he really believed pretty much after he retired from his church in Minneapolis. He teach the Roman Catholic he teaches the Roman Catholic now doctor now if he teaches uh, that we're initially saved by grace alone but after that we must work our way to heaven the grace is not enough faith is not enough Christ is not enough you must have good works so says John Piper Ananthema B John Piper now, he was confronted about that by numerous people, and he doubled down. He did not repent. He doubled down. So if you're a John Piper fan, you better repent. Hopefully I'm not talking to any people like that. There are people among fundamental independent Baptists who are Piperites, disciples of Piper. I know one locally around here or he was, a disciple, a seven-point Calvinist. Seven-point Calvinist is follower of Piper. There are all kinds of strange creatures that are pastoring independent fundamental Baptist churches. All kinds of strange doctrines. Heterodox doctrines. That's what other doctrine is. Heterodox. Different 
different God, different doctrine than, than the faith delivered once for long to the saints. <sighs> Slow down. I've got to speak clear. Okay, so I want to go over to an example of a what I regard as an Orthodox fundamental Baptist uh, preacher, teacher, former missionary. I don't know. I mean, he's probably still involved in missions, I imagine. I'm not going to... Uh, I don't want to really identify him. You'll probably figure it out if you... His name is probably somewhere on the, on the page. Uh, I'm not trying to show it, though, because I do not want to make him the issue... I want to point out uh, a particular article that he's published that illustrates some of these problems. The problems of legalism, the problems of not understanding Scripture properly, the problems of not reading Scripture in context, the problems of being careless with God's work, word, using the Scripture to, to bolster your, your authority falsely. When the scripture's not teaching what you're saying as teaching, you're using it for a purpose other than God's purpose. Serious issues. And I'm not, I'm certainly not, consider, I don't consider this man lost at all. But just an example of teaching that needs to be admonished, you know. <laughs> a lot of things, we don't separate from, from people for, for uh, any bad doctrine, but from doctrine that affects the gospel, seriously affects it, like teaching grace plus works, unacceptable, Condem because that is condemned by the apostles. That is explicitly condemned by Paul, and that will separate you from Christ if you go, if you go down that road. <clears throat> Okay, here's this article. Uh, title is, They Are Too Strict, They Are Too Serious, uh, referring to independent fundamentalist Baptists or other Bible-believing churches, I suppose, Bi Bible churches of some kind. Whatever name they have in the front of the building, which doesn't really matter. Uh, people are going, one of the reasons I think people are going away from the, the, the Baptist name, which isn't a biblical name anyway, is because of the reputation that's been built up by fundamentalists. Certainly Baptists aren't the only fundamentalists. The individual, the home, the church that seeks to take the Bible seriously in Christian living is wild, uh, widely criticized today, even in quote-unquote Christian circles. They are too strict. Now, I don't know what he means by that. Like anybody that doesn't, take the Bible the way we do is not Christian? You can't say that. You cannot say that. If the Spirit of God is in them, if they've been born again, if they belong to Christ, they are our brothers and our sisters, whether you like that or not. Otherwise, we are a sect, a private club, and not the church of Jesus Christ. And some of the Baptist, the fundamentalist Baptist ideas of ecclesiology, church, are simply not biblical either. If we want to be serious about the scripture, we better be serious about what the scripture teaches. Not just abusing the scripture. Using it as a, as a club on people we don't like. What's God's purpose? It's like attacking, well, what was that? Um, Westboro Baptist Church. Remember that? God hates fags. Those people who were just basically a family cult. Disgrace. Dishonored the Lord Jesus. Dishonored. The name Baptist. Wicked. Just seeking attention for themselves, apparently, because they certainly were not preaching the gospel. God seeks to save sinners. If God hated sinners, why did he send his son into the world to save them? 
See, they've forgotten Christ and the gospel. I don't think they're around anymore. They might be. There's churches like them around. Undoubtedly. Just the way the world is. <sighs> they are too strict. They are too serious. They need to lighten up. We shouldn't be fanatics. Unquote. But how is it possible, this is the author here writing, to obey the following scriptures without being exceedingly strict in doctrine and living? Really? I bet you're stricter than Jesus Christ himself. I know you are. I know this guy is. He wouldn't think about drinking a glass of wine. Yet Jesus made 80 gallons of real wine for a wedding. There was no such thing as grape juice unless it was fresh squeezed. No such thing. It's difficult to preserve grape juice. It's that sugar stuff in there and the yeast that's on the outside of the grapes. Squash the grapes, and within hours, you have plenty of alcohol right in there in the juice. Baptist preachers can't even say the word wine at communion. They say juice, which is not what the Scripture says. Although the category of Grape juice will come under the same category as wine. But nevertheless, it's not, I mean, the problem is not that you use grape juice instead of wine. The problem is that you, you've got a man-made law that is actually a stumbling block to the gospel. See, every time you make these things up, there are people who, who won't come near you because of your rules, your false man-made rules. This is an American thing, not a global Christian thing, an American thing that goes back into American history and revivalism and the false moralism of false preachers like Charles Finney and many others. And women with axes. It wasn't about Christ. The same thing with the Salvation Army in England. They forgot the mission if they actually knew the real thing to begin with. And who's this? What's the Salvation Army now? Nothing but a social service organization, even though technically it's supposed to be a church. William Booth did his own things. That's where all the uniforms, the military paraphernalia, it doesn't come from Scripture. He was not faithful to the Word of God. He did what was right in his own eyes. There may be things that the Bible actually teaches or doesn't teach uh, that we don't like. Who is our loyalty is? We're supposed to be conformed to Christ, not to something else. To his image, not to a man-made image. So he goes, quotes some scripture here for us, so I don't have to turn over and use the other page. Teaching them, this is a quote from this, the uh, Great Commission. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. I have commanded you. This is Christ's description of a New Testament church. Actually, it's the way you, use, the way you just misused his word? No. What's the all things Christ commanded his apostles to teach? At the Last Supper, he said, This is my command, that you love one another. How much of the things that uh, people engage in are not in obedience to that command? The unbiblical separation from others for minor cause or no cause at all, 
or things that are contrary to Scripture. And calling that biblical separation when it's none of the kind. Third degree separation. Who knows how far that goes. Fourth degree separation. I separate you from you because you don't separate from somebody else who doesn't separate somebody else who is in error. Or what I say is error. Where does the scripture teach that? Some people care more about what Bob Jones or some other person once upon a time taught than what scripture teaches. Bob Jones also taught and had a rule in his college that people of different quote-unquote races couldn't date. So a black student and a white student couldn't date on his campus. And the scripture teaches that where? And because of that, the government pulled his tax-exempt status, and that, uh, that withdrawal of the tax-exempt status was upheld by the Supreme Court. So who are you following? Some bad teacher or Jesus Christ? What does, Jesus, what, does the, what does the scripture say about races? There's only one race. That's the human race or two races, the human race, those once born and those twice born. If you want to have more than one, those are the racial divisions God has. Those who are of Adam and those who are of Christ. None others. In Christ, there is no race. There aren't Scythians. There aren't Jews. There aren't Gentiles. There aren't Greeks. There aren't barbarians. There aren't even men and women in Christ. Those things are done away with in the kingdom of God. There's no gender in heaven. What purpose would it have? We have one bridegroom, and we're the bride. A church that doesn't take all things seriously is not obeying Christ. This is an absolute twisting of Jesus' words. Contrary to the context, contrary to Christ's teaching. Just taking, he just obviously searched for the phrase all, all things and just throws these verses up. Context ignored. Now I praise you, brethren, this is 1 Corinthians 11, 2, that you remember me in all things. Well, that's not really what's saying there, but. And keep the ordinances. That's a bad, uh, this, is the new, this is the King James. No, this, this is the, the word paradosis is not the word for law or commandment or ordinance. It doesn't mean that. It means uh, um, teaching or tradition. Not really tradition, but sort of it's something passed on. It's a, it is, it is instruction. It's not like commands. Not like laws. As I delivered them to you. Now, were the was the church in Corinth being particularly obedient to Paul's instructions? See, this is no. They were, the, they were the problem church of the New Testament. Problem after problem after problem. They were glorying in immorality in their midst. Probably saying, oh, isn't, isn't the, we, uh, free to sin, free to sin. Thank God Almighty, we're free to sin. Glorying in immorality. And we'll look at that a little bit. This passage deals with so says this author, with hair length, head coverings, and the Lord's Supper. Yes, it does. This section in 1 Corinthians, which are widely considered non-essentials. They are not salvation doctrines. They are not essential doctrines like fundamental doctrines are. The doctrines of Christ. The doctrines of how we're saved. 
And we're going to look at what kind of teachings these really are. Yet Paul praised the church for remembering him and all. This man apparently has forgotten what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. This is totally contrary to the context. And if I recall, Paul in this context is being a bit sarcastic often with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians. Somebody doesn't know how to read the Bible. And it, this is amazing. This is amazing. Now, this guy is, is not, you know, I would not expect this from him. So this is, and I don't want to, to finger him, really, name names, because hopefully he just had a bad hair day or something. Maybe he was suffering from some, you know, when you get older, sometimes you can get weird. Sometimes things don't work right anymore. Lots of things don't work right anymore. Sometimes your mind doesn't work right anymore. Your memory doesn't function properly or rapidly. Have you noticed? Have you been listening to me? Th this is this is a failure to use things, uh, to use the scripture properly. Yes, it does deal. This section, this extended section in 1 Corinthians, uh, at least... Uh, no, about three chapters long here, does deal with issues like this. Now, let's look at the next reference. Again, a little, little, th all things, little leaven. Do you not know that a little leaven leaveneth in a whole lump? Do you, uh, so Paul's talking about a minor sin or something here, right? Just a, a little bit, not following, uh, not being persnickety enough. Well, what is a little leaven that Paul's referring to in 1 Corinthians 5, 6? A man was living in a carnal relationship with his father's wife. And Paul says, not even the Gentiles, not even the unbelieving Gentiles do such things. And the church was fine with it. They were glorying in it. In our liberty in Christ, apparently, And what was his thing? What, what did he say? I have determined to deliver that man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved. I'm determined to let Satan destroy him in order that in the day of judgment his spirit might be saved. So was that a little leaven? What is that kind of thing? It's a minor thing that we have to, to obey all the little minor details? No. Sleeping with your father's wife? I don't know if his father was dead. It wasn't, it apparently wasn't his, Paul wouldn't have put it that way. It was his mother. It was something that causes offense even to the Gentiles. In Corinth, to cause an offense to outsiders in Corinth, that takes a lot. That was sin city of the ancient world. And I'll, there, there's a, a quotation, a verse that he uses that summarizes this whole section quite well. And if you when you see that, you realize, I, when I was working through this, when I realized this, and I was looking at these things in context, all of a sudden I came to a much better understanding of women's hair length and uh, covering the head and all these other issues that have been so much of a pain in, the, in everything for, for many Christians. What to do about these, why Paul is mentioning these things, which are not mentioned under the law. There is no law regarding hair length in the law of Moses. There is no, for men or for women, there is no law against about covering your head for women or men. And since this man mentioned it here, 
as uh, these to the fact that, in his opinion, apparently these are essential things. They're not. There's a reason that they were. They're essential in certain circumstances. Even things like women preaching in the church. There is no law against that in the law of Moses. What, what was Paul getting at? It's important we understand why the Bible teaches what it teaches. Every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. This is another example of refusing to look at the context of the verse you're quoting. Striving for mastery, this is about athletic competition in the world. Like somebody striving to be in the Olympics. Who started those? The Greeks. The gymnasiums comes from the Greeks. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, something that fades away. The glory of athletics. How long does it last? Not very long. But we an incorruptible. So to, to use this, because it says all things, to use it to try to justify your, your, this man's statement that we have to, to be persnickety about every detail, that is not right. We have to understand why God is saying what he's, he's saying. Not be stupid and childish. Whatever, therefore, you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Well, what's the glory of God? God's purpose and salvation. Christ is the glory of God. The true glory of God, because he is the exact representation of God himself. He is God in the flesh. He that has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus said. He is the glory of God. He is what man is supposed to be, the glory of God. The image of God. Jesus is a perfect image of God. Because it says all. Do all. Well, salvation isn't about us doing. It's about God doing. God's doing in us. Give no offense. Now, here's a verse that really summarizes Paul's teaching in this whole extended section in 1 Corinthians. Give no offense neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. That's what all this is about. That's what the hair length issues is about. That's what the head covering issues is about. That's what all this is about, is about not giving offense, not being a hindrance to the gospel, not being a stumbling block for the proclamation of the gospel, not bringing reproach on the gospel. Read it. Read it. Seek to understand it. There is no law about hair length in the scriptures. And Paul, if you can believe that Paul was about establishing new laws, you don't understand anything about Paul. Teach no other doctrine. It's about, this is instruction to not hinder the gospel. To not scandalize your brothers and sisters, or not with your liberty. Talking about what you can eat, that uh, what you're free to eat, but sometimes you have to, to not parade your Christian liberty in front of weak brethren or sisters lest you scandalize them, lest you offend their conscience, unless you, you get them to offend their conscience. When they believe it's sinful and they, you, you goad them into doing something they believe is symbol, sinful, and then you cause them to stumble. 
If you believe it's wrong, then it is wrong for you. There's many rules that people made up. The, the holiness code, no cards, no... Mo what, what, is, what is inherently wrong with a deck of cards? You'd have a tough time answering that. It's like uh, no movies, no dancing, no alcohol. That's not biblical. The Bible has, in the Old Testament, there's about as much praise for wine as there in, is warning about it. Drunkenness is wrong. Being a drunkard means you're not saved. Your life is manifesting something that indicates you're not saved. And it's, it's an offense against the image of God. But Jesus did make 80 gallons of very good wine. The kind of wine that will get you drunk. That was what the scripture indicates definitely. After men are well drunk, then you bring out the poor stuff. But you've saved the best wine for last. In other words, after they're somewhat intoxicated, they won't notice anymore. Some people are going to be offended by this. Search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Nobody's forcing you to listen to me. Search the scriptures. I'm interested in the truth. If I was trying to please you, I'd be teaching all kinds of false doctrines. Easy to please people with lies. That's what the politicians do all the time. As Paul says, if I was seeking to please man, then I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. No man can serve two masters. If you're trying to serve man to please human beings, you can't be pleasing the Lord. Because the flesh is at odds against the Spirit. Give no offense. That is the basic message of Paul throughout this whole section. Hair. These are culturally determined things to a certain degree. Women having... Now, today... We can see this in Islamic culture. A woman must cover her hair. If you're a Christian in an Islamic country, you better keep your head covered, lady. Unless you don't care about giving an offense to Christ, to the gospel. Because in that culture, the woman's hair, the sight of the woman's hair is reserved for her husband alone. To them, it's the equivalent of walking around with bare breasts. If you think that's okay, well, it's, it's not relevant in this country, but in much of the world, it is. A woman is to keep her head covered. Historically, we don't even know where this begins. But Paul says to have a sign of authority on her head. It is the equivalent of our wedding ring. That you're under the authority of your husband or the authority of your father. You're not a prostitute. In Rome, the prostitutes had to shave their heads and they had to wear a man's robe, a toga to identify them as prostitutes so somebody knew what they were buying. They couldn't pass themselves off as virtuous women. And a man, this is an interesting thing, In fact, a man, Paul says, men aren't going to cover your heads when they pray. In Judaism, they cover their heads. They take their prayer shawl or their robe and they cover their heads. 
It's a sign they are under the law. Christian is not under the law. That's why a Christian is not to cover their heads when they're praying, especially in public. Now, if the weather's real bad, I mean, it's, it, you make it into a law, God, under, God looks at the heart, not the external things. People that look at the external things are the Pharisees. God looks on the heart. That's where the sin is, in your heart. People that do things out of rebellion, God sees that. God sees the people that, that just are trying to go along, but inside they reject it. Just like Christ talked about the man that looks on a woman to lust after her, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In other words, he just hasn't done the physical act yet. He's already said, yes, I would, if you could get away with it. He wants to do it. Even if he restrains himself for other reasons. He's already broken the commandment in his heart. Because he desires to do the deed. Even if he can't do it. So it is sin in God's sight because God sees the heart. Again, this is somebody grinding their axe. And the, per the, the purpose of Paul in these things is to not give offense that will be a hindrance to the gospel. Doesn't Paul teach that over and over and over again? To the Jews I am as a Jew, to the Gentiles as a Gentile, that I am all things to all men, that I may be, by all means save some. In other words, I want to get those hindrances that will cause people to reject my message before they even hear it, because they reject what I'm doing, what I, my appearance, or whatever it is. It's like a missionary. You go to another country, you fit yourself into that culture. If you want to go there as an American, you want to celebrate the 4th of July, you want to bring your air conditioners and all your conveniences, don't even think about going because you're not going to serve Christ. Leave your garbage behind. Leave your Americanism behind. You go in Christ's name and no other. If you're not willing to live like the common people where you're going, to live among them, live the same manners that, that, that they do, as far as... Uh, eat and clothing and everything else. I'm not talking about morality. Not that those things that the, the principle, what Paul's teaching us applies. That goes for hair. It's like in, Is, in the Islamic world, there are things Christians ought not do, even if they, they have the Christian liberty to do it, except uh, it, and in private, but you're, you're out in public, you do not do things that will bring a reproach on Jesus Christ. Say, so, oh, look at those Christians. Look at how immoral their women are. Just they're hanging their head out, their hair out in the open. For everyone to see. To them, that's wickedness. You don't do it in public in those places if you are a servant of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? I hope so. I really hope so. This is what we have to strive after. The gospel is central. Christ is central. Anything that does not contribute to that, any other doctrines, any man-made things, anything that would hinder people coming to Christ, other than the cross and Christ himself, has to go. Has to go. If we love the Lord, if we are about his mission, which is to save the sinners. There's a whole lot of things that have to be swept out of the church. There's a whole lot of leaven in the churches, all kinds of churches. 
And if the name fundamentalist independent Baptist brings a reproach from the world because of things that people have done, between, because of attitudes people have displayed, time to change the sign to something that honors Christ, something that isn't a reproach. Not something to please the flesh, but something that does not, that is not an offense to Christ because of the bad behaviors of people in the past who used that name. There's nothing holy about the name other than the name of Christ. We don't have much time left, brothers and sisters. Christ is returning. If people aren't on the ark, they're going to be lost. If they're not in Christ, they're not saved. He is salvation. What is your church about? What is the message you're delivering? What is the kind of gospel you're preaching? Have you sanctified your message? So it is the doctrine of the apostles, the doctrine of the apostles regarding salvation? Or are you preaching what you want to preach, your own message? Are you mixing it with things that scandalize people? Are you into partisan politics? Are you into trying to change the world in its morality? Are you out there marching in the street protesting sinners? Then you're not serving Christ. Are you out there protesting the world and his vices? You're not serving Christ. Jesus didn't do that. He ate with sinners. He ate with tax collectors. He ate with prostitutes. He welcomed them to come listen to him. The Pharisees, they were his enemies. They didn't want to hear him because they thought they were righteous in themselves. The tax collectors and the prostitutes gladly heard them because they found a message, a gospel, where God saves sinners, and they knew they were sinners. They knew there was no salvation for them under the law. But they found that God had sent a Savior, his own son, who was interested in saving sinners. That's where we have to focus our attention. In the short time we have remaining, 